So we're doing a study in the book of Hebrews. Um, we took a little a hiatus from it uh, just to talk about communion a little bit. Uh, we're in Hebrews chapter four, just studying the idea. And I'll do a really, really short recap of what we've done so far. You know, the book of Hebrews, um, it was, it's written in the title, who the book was written to. It was written to the Hebrews. This book was written to them, but it was written for you. So a lot of what you see in the book, you must understand the context of what was happening at the time when the book of Hebrews was written. The book of Hebrews is written right around uh, 70, I'm sorry, 63, 62, 65 AD. This is just about 70 years or so before the big destruction of Jerusalem occurred. Um, and it's recorded in the scriptures. It's recorded in Wikipedia. It's recorded by Josephus there. Uh, Eustabus is another um, person that also recorded, recorded this concept, the destruction of Jerusalem. So these Jews were in Jerusalem and they were in trouble. And they were in trouble because there was lots and lots of persecution that was occurring and they were very afraid for their lives. And it was not a good season to be Jew. As a matter of fact, what was happening was that they were they told these Jews, hey, we will give you in, in the Roman Empire, we'll give you a le leeway to worship your Jewish God. But when these Jews had given their lives to Jesus and said, Jesus, you are one thing, the only thing that is like, well, that deal doesn't apply to you if you want to serve Jesus deal only applies to you if you were Jewish. And so there was lots and lots of persecution that was occurring for them. And the reason why the persecution was occurring was because for 1500 years before, all the Jewish people knew was sacrifices of the law. They knew how to make these sacrifices. They knew about their high priests. They knew about everything that occurred then. And this was their life. This was everything they knew. And then this guy, Jesus, shows up and he turns the table over. And he says, hey, what, guys? You know that sacrifice you did? I'm your sacrifice. You remember the high priest? I'm your high priest. Remember how the angels would come and say stuff? I'm your guy right now. So you have culture of 1,500 years getting turned over in one fail swoop. I mean, listen, if if I go to the same grocery store, I like going to the same grocery store all the time. We were talking, Quan likes that Costco right close to his house. That's the one he likes going to, right? We like we like that routine. We like that that same. We we like to know what's expected. We like the expected, right? And so for fifteen hundred years of culture, these guys were. This is how we do it. This is the way it's done. And Jesus shows, up. guys. When Jesus shows up, it kind of turns things over, you know. Jesus will throw over the tables. Jesus would say, "Hey, man." That was great what you were doing before, but I've got a better way. And that's why I entitled this, Jesus is Better. Because as much as what they were doing was working for them, it was great. Because the Bible does say there's a glory in the law. There is something better, and that better is Jesus. And sometimes you have to, many times, you have to let go of the old. You have to let go of that which was probably tradition that which was quote unquote working to encounter the new. The example I used at the beginning of this, um, when I started the series, uh, six, however long ago I started the series, was there was a time when you could not tell me that there was a better ice cream than Briars. There was no way you could tell me there's something better than Briars. And one day popped up, I saw this thing called Tillamonk ice cream. And right now in my fridge, there are four of them. <laughs> I found out that Walmart started carrying them. Walmart didn't used to carry them before. Now Walmart sells a portion that's a, almost like five, six, but I'm like, whoa, this is awesome. Now I have a new covenant of Tillamonk. I have put away the old covenant of Briars. I'm living in the new covenant of Tillamonk. It really is like that. And so as we talked about this, this study with the book of Hebrews, we said a couple of things. So Jesus is better. And Jesus is better 
than the angels. And if you remember, whenever God was about to do something big, make a huge announcement, he would always send an angel. Talk about this Christmas season. He went to Mary, said, blessed are thou among women. Blessed are the fruit of thy womb. Because if Jesus wants to make, if God was to make a big announcement, yeah, that's a good idea. Go grab an angel, go talk to people, have them have to change their underpants. Like it's a big deal. Because that's what happens when angels show up. The first word they always like to say is fear not. You know why angels have to say fear not when they show up? When you see them, whoa, that's scary. This is amazing. And so Jesus showed up. I'm sorry. The, the angel showed up with um, to, to Mary and appeared to Mary. And so the, to the mind of a Jew, and we have to put ourselves in the mind of a Jewish person who is in the midst of, I'm getting, my cousin just got killed because he's a Christian. We have this tradition that was working well. And this Jesus guy shows up. We saw him get crucified. And then we hear all these great stories of Jesus rising from the dead and being ascended. About 500 people accounted to the testimony of Jesus' resurrection and ascension. And they talked about that. But for me, as, this, as a Jew in that season... I am super tempted to go back to the law because it's safe. It's super tempting to go back and say, man, why don't I just go back? But the point of this book of Hebrews is don't go back. Don't go back to the law. Don't go back to the old covenant system. Don't go back to this covenant of condemnation, but stay with this covenant of affirmation because that's what Jesus wants. So these guys knew, hey, if an angel's involved, it's got to be a big deal. And Jesus shows up and say, hey, I'm better than angels. Whoa, that caught their attention. Of course, that caught their attention. Then Jesus as well made the statement to them that I am your high priest. Like, whoa, if Jesus is my high priest, no, in the mind of a Jew, for us, we don't think much about a high priest. I mean, I, I'm not like a high priest. Like, I don't wear the ephod and I don't wear the little roby thing. Like, you know, like what's high? So the high priest was this person that was responsible for putting together the sacrifices and he was responsible for taking care of everything. And by the way, what the high priest would do is that they would bring this goat and the goat would be inspected and based on the quality of the, the goat, based on the quality of the sacrifice, it would determine how much this, this thing would be washed away. That's a great New Testament co concept because it is not based on you. It is based on the quality of the sacrifice. Who was the great sacrifice? It was Jesus Christ, right? And so that sacrifice was, is, is Jesus. And for high priests, what they would do is that the high priest would have bells around his ankles. And so when the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, make the sacrifice, go into the Holy of Holies, the high priest would keep walking and he would make sacrifice. You know why he kept walking? Because he wanted to make sure you were hearing bells. Because you know what will happen when you stop hearing bells? There's no more high priest. <laughs> so the high priest was a highly revered person. Wow, this is the guy who is holy enough. He is righteous enough. He's amazing enough to be the one that would step into holy of holies and keep walking. And the reason why is that, you know, what they would do is that he would have the bells on his foot. And they would tie a rope to his foot. Stop hearing it. Because remember, you can't just go, oh, wait, we stop hearing bells. That's no collector's body. You couldn't just roll up into the Holy of Holies and say, hey, let me just grab his body. No, it didn't quite work like that. Let's go pull him out with the rope. So Jesus shows up and says, man, I'm better than these high priests. I am the high. I am your high priest. So in their mind, something goes off and say, whoa, this guy's awesome. This guy's amazing. He is my high priest. He is better than angels. He is the one. And so for them, in their context and their mind, they realize we're in persecution. 
things are not looking good for us. They keep talking about this big destruction that's going to happen. I know it's going to happen soon. I'm going to go ahead and stick with Jesus. And so there's often a temptation in your life to go back to the normal, to go back to the ordinary, to go back to the thing that you were comfortable with. You, you, you serve the Lord. You got into the things of the Lord. You get baptized. You come into him and things are great and you're excited. But then life starts playing you. Life starts poking away at you. And like, man, I, I know I gave my life to Jesus, but it started to not feel as fun. It started to feel a little hard. Don't go back. Do not go back to the old. Do not go back to the mundane. That's the testimony. That's the story for you. That we're in this process. Jesus is better. As Kathy said during our time of um, transition, no one has ever connected their heart to Jesus and said, whoa, that was a bad idea. Because Jesus is always better. So let's um, go to the uh, first. Thing. This, this, this I, I want you to get some context on. So this chapter four, so that was a little brief repeat. Chapter four is about rest. It's about Jesus being a rest. And rest is not just a piece of real estate. Rest is not the thing that you do for eight to nine hours, but rest is a posture of heart where you are resting in the finished work of the cross. And so oftentimes when we think rest, we think inactivity, and we think passivity, and I'm going to talk about it in a little bit, but I, I want to anchor this message into this scripture. And I shared it a little bit in our time of worship. John chapter 6 and verse 20 to 29 says, Then they asked, what must we do to do the works God required? It's an important question. What's the big thing that God wants from me? What's the big thing? God, if there is something you need from me, tell me. This was his answer. Jesus answered them and said, this is the work of God. So there's no argument, no disputing what the most important thing that you believe on him whom he has sent. Your belief, you believing in Christ, that is your starting point. That text does not say, what must we do to do the work of God? You must pray and fast twice a year. That text does not say, what must we do to do the work of God? you got to be a good church attender. That text does not say, what must you do to do the work of God? Only the tithers are the great ones. As Kayla said yesterday, tithing is for children. <laughs> Last week she said that. <laughs> Sasha loved that one. 10% yeah, is kid stuff, right? Th that, that text does not give an indication of an action you need to do. It must mean that there is something about this believing that's super important. What? Because right believing, right thinking is very important. Because you realize that you could believe the wrong thing. I'm telling you, you remember when we were 25 and it was so great. Boy, we believe that we're invincible. We believe, I'm telling you, we would, go, <sighs> that invincible feeling, you know? How do you still believe that? <laughs> when I go to the gym, I realize I'm not as invincible as I was when I was 25. <laughs> So, don't feel that way. This is often what happens when I when I think of this. You, you're you're probably thinking to me, boy, this this sounds like some Disney World pixie dust stuff. Like you mean, all I need to do is wish upon a star, believe what you are. Like, come on, Pastor Andre, it's, it's got to be more than I've got to have something to do. 
There's a great John Crowder says, if you want to do, 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 you will probably end up in doo doo. <laughs> that's where you, that's where doing usually ends up. You have to believe. And this is the fight that I fight every day. This is the thing that I do every day. God, I want to believe the words that you're saying. You said I am righteous. You said I am holy. But God, I didn't have a holy thought on my way to church today. It was three of them that wasn't so holy. We inspect the lamb. When you inspect the sacrifice, it is the basis of the sacrifice. Jesus was the sacrifice. You must believe what God has said. And the problem is, is that we struggle to believe what God has said about us. Remember that text? And we know it. Who do, who do men say I am? Remember that? Who do men say I am? It's a text that Jesus asked Peter. Who do men say I am? Actually, it wasn't Jesus asked Peter. And then some said Elijah, some said John. Who, who, who do you say I am? challenge you to flip that around in asking God who do we say God is and ask the question who does God say you are say I promise you if you knew who God says you are if you knew what God said about Alia it'll change Alia's life if you knew what God said about Shai it'll change Shai's life that's the challenge often. We struggle to realize what did God say about me? And so one of the things that I do now is that if I run into someone who I know has a call of God in their life and they're struggling in their call, they're not living for God. They, they're not doing the things that God would have, that they should be doing. What I do is that I try to think prophecies did especially if they were part of this community at some point, what prophecies did we prophesy over them about what God is doing? And I start, every time I think of them, I pray those prophecies over them. I pray what God is saying over them because they're not living up to it right now. It doesn't mean that God's call is still not upon their life. And so there's this dissonance, this disconnect that occurs often when we know what God wants to do but we don't see him doing it. So let's hang the, the, this message, this concept. The work of God is to do that which is to believe on God and he, he who is it. Rest. Chapter four. Talk a lot about rest. Rest, rest, rest. Let's talk about what rest is not. Rest is not inactivity, reluctance to take action. Rest is not passivity, accepting what has happened. That's not rest. Rest is very active. It's kind of hard to reconcile those concepts. So one way I could reconcile it is when I think of patience, we often think of patience as the length of time that we wait for something. But patience is really the attitude we have while we're waiting. So if we change that definition to patient, how patient are we? Because <laughs> we I'm waiting long times for a lot of stuff. But if patience is defined better as the attitude we have while we're waiting, it changes the flavor of what patience is. Let's think of peace. Peace is a person. Peace is not simply the absence of war but peace the person whose name is Jesus Christ. So when I think of rest, the automatic thing is to think, oh, let's just chill out. Let's just relax. Let's just, no, rest is active. That rest is actively believing that God said what he said, and we will not go back under the law. Oh, it's unfortunate. My wife's a trained marriage and family counselor, and she often runs into um, abused spouses. 
Um, and unfortunately, the abuse goes both ways. Men abuse women, women abuse men. It's, it's not a good thing. And so she goes through the process and she says, hey, you're being abused. Let's go ahead and let's take action. Let's, re let's take some action. But when you take action, you have to settle your heart. This is what needs to get done. That's part of the rest component, settling the heart. And so oftentimes, sometimes the abuser would say, the, the person who has been abused would say, no, no, Kayla, I'm blessed in Jesus' name. I'm resting in God. God is good. I'm not taking any action because Jesus loves me. But you're being abused, but no, but Jesus loves me. Jesus loves him. Jesus loves everyone. There's this disconnect that seems to occur when we're resting, we're not taking action. Resting is very active. Resting is actively believing, as that John chapter 6 uh, text described, it's actively believing on the one who sent you. One who was sent. And when you're actively believing in the context of Hebrews, these guys were like, I am going to con settle my heart that this Jesus who came is my high priest. He is better than angels. And I don't need to go back to the 1500 years of law. Rest takes courage. So I remember, uh, yeah, it's like almost like 10 years ago. And I know this happens to guys a lot. Um, you feel like this little pain somewhere in your body. I like, I ain't going to no doctor. <laughs> I don't want to go. No, I'm not going. What, why am I doing that for? And so I start making up these stories in my mind. Like, oh, no, I don't need to go. It's going to be fine. Whatever. But then I, one day I realized that it took courage for me to face hearing whatever diagnosis that the doctor had to say, and then saying, Lord, there's a greater reality than the diagnosis that I'm seeing. Faith is not ignoring the reality. Faith is recognizing there's a greater reality than what the doctor has said. Say that again. Faith is not ignoring what you see. It is not ignoring the, the abuse. He said, I'm ignoring that I have black eyes every day. That's not faith. That's not faith ignoring what we see. Faith is saying, I see that, but I trump you, Jesus, over that. I have a greater reality, which is Jesus over that. I think that takes extreme courage. That takes courage for you to say, I will not just sit. I will not just be inactive. But I will actively say, God, I believe you in this state and this position that I'm in. So rest is not inactive and it is not passive, but it is us actively believing what the Father has said about us. So let's roll um, this is end of verse chapter three. We're going to do more verse chapter four. But I did want to mention about this verse here in chapter three. It says, and so we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. They were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Enter where? Enter what? The promised land. Detect the Part of uh, Hebrews chapter 3 was actually giving reference to the story of when they were taken out, the uh, children of Israel, taken out of slavery and was going towards the promised land. And if you know the text, not all of them entered the promised land. And the Bible says that the reason they did not enter into the place that they're supposed to enter is because of unbelief. My friend, Unbelief will stop you from entering the fullness of who God will have you, where God will have you to enter. Um, so do you remember the text where it says, if you have faith and doubt not, you'll see. 
There's two components there. Faith and doubt not. Oftentimes when we're faced with a challenge, the first order of business is we say, Lord, increase our faith. God, we need more faith. I need more faith to get through this thing. I want to challenge you that it may not be your faith that's the issue. It may not be your faith. It may actually be your unbelief. Here's why. The Bible says that God has dealt unto every man a measure of faith. He said, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you could look into mountain and say, be thou removed and be cast into the sea. So it doesn't really take a whole lot of faith to get things done. But you have to have that faith without doubt. Faith with no doubt is miracles. How do you get rid of doubt? For me, I get rid of doubt by hearing testimonies. I, if I've got a challenge, a problem in my life, I go and ask around, let me go look on the internet, see if I could find somewhere going like Bethel's side or whatever. Who's been through this issue that I'm going through? Let me see what breakthrough they've received. And I listen to their testimony and watch my doubt go down. Because when you if, if you think, I think of doubt also, it's the same way I think of like in a garden. So doubt is like weeds and faith is like real plants. When rain falls, it's raining on both the good stuff and the bad stuff. And I think that's what happens. So this is my second way of how I deal with doubt. I get myself in the presence of the Lord. Because think of it this way. The presence of the Lord is that atmosphere, that environment, that doubt will show up itself. It would, it grows. You're like, oh, I, I, I didn't know I had that level of doubt. Well, that's a lot of doubt I have there. And as that doubt begins to you could see, ah, I found it, I pull it, I pluck it out. As I have faith and I don't doubt is where I'm able to see great breakthrough. So th that, that becomes like the question um, in, in our hearts and our lives, what's the thing that you keep asking God for? Hey, I need more faith for this. The answer may not be the faith. The answer may be the doubt. I tell you, if you deal with the doubt part, you would notice, wow, I didn't realize I had so much faith for this matter because the doubt seems to have gone away. The, the, whoa, there's lots of faith around here because all the, the Faith is growing, the, the, the plants are growing, but all these weeds of doubt are all over the place. It's like you can't see anything but doubt here. Faith and doubt not, you see breakthrough. So what's that thing? that you're struggling with and asking God for faith for. God wants to bring real breakthrough. It, you have to address the doubt in your heart. You, you have to deal with that doubt in your heart. I know for me, it's super easy because if you're like me and you, ha you have an intellectual bent and you're always thinking, well, what about this God? What about this God? What about this God? What about this? What about that? What about the other? I mean, I, 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 could, I could manufacture things to be doubtful about <laughs> in my mind. I could, make a, I could make a whole story and scenario full of doubt. I, I remember Bill Johnson used to say, when, you, when people come in the line for prayer, he said, please, please don't tell me all of your, of your symptoms and all that's going on because I don't want the little bit of faith that I have here to, to run away with all the doubt that you're bringing here for me. Deal, deal with doubt. It's, it's, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. And so the, the children of Israel, they, it was the doubt that kept them out of the promised land. Here's this next point in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 2 and 3. Going back, 
unto this rest subject matter it says, for indeed we have good news preached to us, but just as they did, but the word they heard did not benefit them because was not united with faith. Because united with those who listened with faith for we who have blessed for we who have believed entered that rest just as he said adding another component to the part so it's faith less doubt equal breakthrough let's add this piece in the spoken word of god mixed with faith less doubt equal breakthrough I, my algebraic mind is having so much fun with this algebra problem right now. You know, like I look at the math teacher. She's like, oh, this is awesome. The math people in the room are like loving this. <laughs> God's word plus faith minus doubt equal sign breakthrough. What I find interesting with this is that the Bible says they heard the word and it benefited not them. You mean to tell me that I could get a word straight from God? And I could take that word straight from God and say, eh, that word's just there. Let's put that to the side. How many words have we received from the Lord? We take that word and we just put it to the side. It, you're like, at first when you received it, you're like, man, it's a great word. But somehow we didn't add our faith to it. And it simply did nothing for us. The word of God has power all by itself. But God is looking for those to co-labor with him to experience the fullness of what he has. Faith, you know, God's word. Connected with your faith, less doubt, you will see breakthrough. One, um, God's word is so powerful. Luke 1 27, you probably know it from the King James where it says, for with God, nothing will be impossible. It's an easy text. We know it from the King James. Some translations, uh, I think the ESV and uh, there's a bunch of translation that says, let me read the word that I have here. It says, for no word of the Lord is void of power. No word of the Lord is void of power. With God, nothing shall be impossible. So let's take it from this translation. No word of the Lord is void of power. And that word, I believe, is the word where we get the word rhema from, which is that active quick word. It's the Greek word for rhema. So it says to me that when God speaks a word, it comes with everything inside of it ready to take action so that you can receive breakthrough. No word of the Lord is void of power. When God speaks something, it's, a, it's fully loaded. It's a full clip, full magazine. It's that fully loaded car. It's already equipped. Everything is inside of it. It's that juicy brisket. It's got everything inside of it. Husband makes really great briskets. <laughs> I, I keep saying he's my favorite member that doesn't come to this church. <laughs> he's awesome. He's an awesome. He makes incredible briskets. It comes complete with everything to accomplish what it's supposed to do. What's the point of having a word that's complete, that's full with everything, that's built in with power, if I don't apply my faith to it? I must, when God speaks a word, add my faith, come into agree. Word of faith, woman, just to say it this way. I set my faith in agreement with yours. That's how it was. Because we must take our faith. The low measure, it doesn't take a lot. Lord, I believe. You said it. I believe it. 
And the problem often happens is when God says that you're righteous, when God says that you're holy, when God says that you're amazing, when God says that you're awesome, the actions that you may have done, you, you, you may have been on the verge of insanity, you may have been on the verge of profanity one day. And you might say, I can't believe that. I don't know how to believe that. Take your faith. Take God's word. Take what he said. Apply your faith. Take away doubt. You got breakthrough. God just wants you to believe what he said. Just believe what he said. Come on. Come on. So for these Hebrews, tons and tons of persecution, they're like, guys, we've got it really rough here. We want to go back to the law. We want to, it's so much easier to get a sacrifice every once a year. Just do what we're supposed to do. It's so easy. And Jesus is like, no, you've got something a lot better. Take the little bit of faith you have and walk out the fullness of who you are. The word did not prop. Let, do not have the word of God, precious voice and rhema word of God come to you and you, it, it has no power in you. Everything's been provided by grace, but it has to be activated by faith. It's all been provided. But nothing happens until you're activated. I, I could, I, I could say as much as I want to. Wow. I. You 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 get my point. I was going to use another food example, but I sh I'll I'll quit at that point. <laughs> no more food. I'll leave the food example for another time. Amen. Chapter, verse 9 reads, therefore, let us diligently enter that rest so that no one will fall through the example, for, for through following the same example of disobedience. The King James, actually, this is the NASB, the King James actually uses the word instead of diligent. It says, let us labor to enter into his rest. It sounds almost like an oxymoron. Let us work to not work, let us work hard to rest. That's the point. The point is, is that to enter into this rest, that we enter into the understanding of the finished work of the cross, it takes intentional effort. You're laboring to enter this rest. Uh, years ago, my wife worked for, um, uh, I don't know what they call it. It's a Jewish family. But the, the ones who, um, when the Sabbath comes, they shut down everything and they go to temple. Um, uh, I think they were Orthodox Jews. And, and so I, my wife worked for them. She, she was a, a housekeeper at the time for them. And, and they would call and say, uh, Miss Kayla, could you go switch off that light switch for me? You were like two feet away. The effort it would have taken you to call me to switch that light off, you could have switched that light off. Uh, Miss Kayla, uh, could, could, could you come and, and um, put on the stove for me? I, I was just feeding your kid. I, I was just doing it, it yeah, because it was coming close to sundown or, or whatever. And for us, it sounds odd and it sounds awkward, right? And it is kind of odd and awkward, right? But as I was pondering on that, as I prepared for today's message, I, I almost feel as if one of the reasons why God in the Old Testament made this point about the Sabbath, because the Sabbath is the day of rest, and Jesus is now our Sabbath, so we are in him, so we are resting in the finished work. It's an outward, external rest. It is us resting in him. But I feel one of the reasons was, God wanted to make intentional and point out to us that just as silly as it is for you to say, 
I'm not going to work. I'm not going to let my ox work. I'm not going to let my servant work. I'm not going to let anyone work. That's what the Old Testament text is. As awkward as it sounds, God was making a point to say, you have to stop all of your work in order for you to enter into this finished work. He was making it so obvious. So as obvious as it was that, wow, she could have just come switch the light switch on. No, God is saying, as, so as obvious as it is for you to say, I've got a problem. Let me get five days of prayer and fast. I'll have a problem praying fast. Let me get into the world. Let me, and you're ready to get into this work mindset and this work mentality. As obvious as it is to you to do that, God's saying, hold on a second. Simple. Rest in my finished work. Rest what I've said. Back it down there, Sparky. Right. I'll give you this one more. This. So in the whole context of this chapter, chapter four, it says, let us labor to enter into his rest. It talks about the Sabbath rest. The rest is not just a piece of real estate. The promised land was not just a piece of real estate. But it's a posture of heart that says the finished work of the cross is available for me in every aspect, in every respect. This scripture pops in right in the middle. It's kind of a weird one to put right in the middle of nowhere. Because we've heard this scripture many, many times, right? And if you've ever been around, you you know scripture. It says, for the word of God is living. James says it is sharp. It is living and active and is sharper than any two-edged sword, uh, even penetrating as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. So this is what I knew when I grew up in church. This scripture was usually used to say, hey, we've got a preacher that's coming to town and he's going to be a little bit of a jerk because he's going to come and he's going to call on everybody's sin. And he's going to come and he's going to give a tough word. And he's going to tell us where we're going. And it's going to be a crazy type thing. That's why I knew that. That's the only context I had for the text. Because the word of God is sharp. It's going to cut through the marrow. That word cuts you? Yeah. That was the only context I had for this word. But I feel in the overarching context of Hebrews chapter four, it is God's word is able to help you discern what is the law, what is grace. That's how I interpret this text. It's able to say, hey, that's law. Don't do that. Don't go back. That was their temptation, going back under the law. But the word of God is quick and sharp, helping you to discern and realizing you don't need to go back to the law. And so oftentimes when we get, we have an understanding of grace, we have an understanding of the finished work of the cross. What often happens is we, we test what, is, what, what some call, we test the waters of freedom. I remember uh, Lynn Howes was saying when he started preaching grace, he said, man, everybody started testing the waters of freedom. He said, and I'll, 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 I've seen this happen too. He says this, he started preaching grace and people who love the Lord had to check them into rehab. People who love the Lord, we were helping them find lawyers for the divorce. People who love the Lord were a wreck because they repented from something but didn't repent to something. The word of God is quick, sharp, and intuitive, so it helps you understand, I, this, I can't do that. When we had our members meeting a couple months ago, uh, the question was asked, what does it mean to have a godly lifestyle? That's one of the requirements to be a member here. Live a godly lifestyle. What does that mean? I had a simple answer. Ask the Holy Spirit. 
if you're in doubt, come and ask me. I'll, we'll dis, let decide what the Holy Spirit says. So I'm pretty sure the Holy Spirit's not going to help you get checked to rehab. <laughs> Let's kind of put that one out there, right? That's pretty easy, right? Holy Spirit's not going to help you get checked. Well, Holy Spirit's not going to lead you down a path that's going to make you get checked. To, yes, he'll help you to get to rehab. I said that wrong. He'll help you <laughs> when you're in rehab. But he's not going to want to say, you know what? Just keep drinking. Just keep drinking. It is gr- We are in the... It is grace upon grace upon grace. That's not him. That's not him. And the great Dr. Lynn House said, he said, boy, he started checking so many people into rehab. He started so many uh, believers getting divorced because they're like, oh, well, uh, uh, God loves me. And God loves this other lady that's in the office with me. And God loves everyone. So let me share the love. Good, nice Christian people end up in all this trouble. And he said the temptation came. He says, boy, maybe I should start pulling back on this grace stuff. Maybe this grace stuff is a little too much. Maybe I should start stop preaching this grace so much. And then the Lord gave him a revelation. He says, you remember when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, Right? Where was the first, they traveled this, it was, it was actually for 40 years, back and forth in the wilderness. It was an 11 mile journey, took them 40 years. But the end point was to get to the promised land. He says, where did they get out when they were in, of Egypt? The Bible says that they went through this place called the wilderness of sin. Now, sin is not the sin as we know as a moral issue. Sin is actually a place that was, was just happened to name of the place it was called wilderness of sin. Right? That's just an, it just happened to be called the wilderness of sin. It's not actually sin. And the Lord spoke to him and he said, when people get free from bondage, the first place they're going to end up is testing the waters of what sin looks like. That's what happens in a lot of grace movements and a lot of these camps. And unfortunately, many of them get stuck there. They get stuck in and out and traveling and going. What should take, uh, uh, is what's 11 miles is taking 40 years. Lives wrecked, checked into rehab because they're in the wilderness of sin. Wilderness of sin. You'd never hear that coming from us. We are, we want to, we, we're going to preach grace, but you're going from bondage toward the kingdom. And he says, what happened? As they're traveling in the wilderness of sin, they came to the waters of Marah. And what what happened? They cut a tree down and they put it in the water. Lord said to him, the answer when you see people running through the wilderness of sin is preach the cross. Preach the cross with power. Preach the cross as it is. Preach the simplicity of the cross. Because that tree, I was cursed to hang on a tree. We know that tree represents the cross. And when that cross, and it, it is said that when, when that tree got into the water, because they, they were in this wilderness and they started to drink from the waters of Mara. And what did they find out? The water was what? Bitter. When you end up in the wilderness of sin, it tastes bitter. Sin is bitter. And in this case, bitter is not better. (laughs) I used to have a health freak I used to hang out with. He used to say, hey, when you're taking healthy foods, bitter is better. I like, can I have a steak? (laughs) With butter. I always say, but butter is better. (laughs) So they end up in this wilderness, the wilderness of sin. And they in there, and they're tasting the bitterness of rehab, the bitterness of divorce, the bitterness of their kids not loving them. What did Moses do? He cuts down a tree. He says, when they get out of bondage, they're going to try to test the waters of what freedom looks like. They're going to end up by the brook Mara. They're going to taste this water. They're going to realize how bitter this water is. 
And then you're going to need to cut down a tree. You're going to need to preach the cross even more. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. So he, so he cuts it down. What the Bible says is that these guys, they began to have a diarrhea reaction to the bitter water. I mean, it was rough. It was a diarrhea reaction. Because sometimes... When you're testing the waters of sin, when you're testing those waters out, you're going to need a clean out. You're going to need to go to therapy. <laughs> you're going to need to see someone. When you're testing the waters of sin, the diet that you had of garlic and onions from, the, from Egypt, the diet that you had in Egypt is not going to cut it anymore. You're going to need a new diet. And so it's, it's my understanding that, that the tree, I don't know the name of the tree, but that tree that was cut down and put into the um, waters, the Bible says that it turned the bitter water fresh or the bitter water sweet, depending on what translation you're looking at. And it, whatever occurred with that sweet water, some theologians, uh, I'm sorry, that, that whatever the tree it was, medically, that tree is something that when they were drinking that water, it was almost like Gatorade in the sense of it was like an electrolyte for them. So it was able to help them on the journey of where they're going. So when we test the waters of sin, God comes it lets you realize sin is bitter. But as you come into the fullness of who God is, he's, and you drink of the freshness of what the cross produces, because the cross produces that fresh water. The tree that was cut down produced that fresh water. It now nourishes you for the length of your long journey, for your journey. It nourishes you on your way. Because oftentimes in the midst of passing through this wilderness, we often forget what God has done. Like I, 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 side note, side note. These children of Israel, they were enslaved for 400 years. God comes and delivers them supernaturally. And they were still complaining. I mean, think, think about this, this deliverance. That would be like, like when God delivered the children of Israel from slavery, that would be like in our time, well, like a hundred years ago, like someone like a Frederick Douglass rolls up into the White House and he says, from this day forward, there's no more slavery. We are not taking any more, there to be no more slavery ever right now from this day onwards. That's what is it. Who said so? God of our Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's what we do right now. That, that's basically what Moses, he rolled up to the Pharaoh and says, hey, tell that old Pharaoh, let my people go. That would be like one of these guys roll up into the White House and say, no more slavery as of this day forward. Done. It's over. How do you think that went over? How, how do you think that would have gone over? No. And, right, God delivered them 400 years with back pay. It would, would be like if they got their 40 acres and a mule as well. I mean, that, that's the, the extent of the deliverance that occurred when God took the children of Israel out of Egypt into the promised land. And on top of that, they're running for their life. Armies in the back of them, red sea in the front of them. Moses shows up, grabs stick, him and Charlton Heston. I mean, it was great. It was awesome. Part the Red Sea. You know, so, some, some have theorized that, hey, you know, at that time of year, that wasn't such a great miracle. That time of year, the Red Sea was only this thick high, and they kind of walk over. Well, if God drowned the entire Egyptian army in two feet of water, that's a bigger miracle in my book. That's a bigger miracle in my book. And so, 
they walk across on dry land. Then it's hot during the day. Oh my gosh, it's like South Florida in the desert. It's hot. It's like, oh my gosh, there's no AC. They were looking for Jose to come and bring some AC. God provides a pillar of he provides a cloud a day. Then he provides at night a fire for them. So they warm at night. Yet they're still complaining. They're like, oh my gosh, I wish I could go back to Egypt. I wish I could go back to the well. God has, he, you have a little bit of the revelation of grace. You, you're starting to connect your mind, your heart with what the message of grace is. And you're making problems. You say, God, I, I want to go back. I want to go back to bond. I want to go back to, to the law. Don't go back. Don't be like the children of Israel who complain their way through the process. That's the part that really gets me. Right? This is the part that really gets me. The Bible says that, they, that God brought manna from heaven. One text describes it as this manna was like bread with the taste of honey. And I forget what the other thing it tastes like. Give me a little poetic license here. But it's very possible. I'll get poetic license. This is not in the Bible. You, do, you can edit this out. Poetic license. It was probably Krispy Kreme that was the manner from heaven. <laughs> it, it was probably Krispy What is it that tastes like honey that it looks like bread? It was probably Krispy Kreme. It was not broccoli. That it was not because it was bread. It, it, broccoli doesn't taste like bread. <laughs> so imagine you got Krispy Kreme that's good for, because if it's from heaven, it's got to be good. It has no calories, right? It's got to be great. It's got to be great. God is raining down manna from heaven. And these dudes are complaining. You've got to be kidding me. You have to be kidding me. You have to be kidding me. Don't go back. Don't go back. You might be thinking, yeah, God, I thank you for pillar by night, cloud by night, pillar by day. Well, you know what I mean. <laughs> cloud by day. Pillar by night. Yeah. Yeah. Dyslexia for Q found. Uh, <laughs> he, he's got all this stuff. But yet still, the children of Israel complained. This. Do, do not go back to Egypt. Do not go back to bondage. Do not go back to that season. You've, you've come this far. You're grasping grace. You, you, you may be in a season where you're testing the waters of sin. You're testing what freedom looks like. But I'm telling you, that's going to lead to bitterness. You want to get from Egypt towards the promised land. You want to get to that place that God has designed for you and rest in the finished work of Christ. Amen. Let's stand together. Thank you, Lord. It's never been about performance, striving, earning it's by the blood and Christ completely did the work he did it for you so this morning I'd be in a place where you're 
somewhere between the bondage of religion, but you still haven't really grasped the fullness of the finished work of the cross. This morning, I, I ask, I'm going to ask you to have a conversation with the Lord. You and the Holy Spirit, connect your heart with him. And say, Lord, lead me in. I will believe. I would receive your word. I will not doubt. I'll add my faith. And I want to see the fullness of who you are. Yes, Jesus. What must you do to do the work of God? Believe on him who sent me. Yes, Lord, I believe. Yes, Lord, I believe. Yes, Lord, I believe. Yes, Lord, I believe. Let's do that exercise because it's always good to do it. Who does God say you are? I want you to take a moment and ask the Lord, who is he saying you are? What does God say about David? What does God say about Carol? What is God saying about an ant? What is God saying about Amy? What is God saying about Rosa? What is God saying about Veronica? What is God saying about Josh? Just quiet your heart and say, Lord, what are you saying about me? And he may repeat something he said before in the past, but it's always good to remember what did God say about you? And then you get to live from that place. What does he say? not performing. It's not striving for acceptance. You've been included. He did not leave you out. So I want to also give an opportunity. If you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, we're talking about this turning away from, turning towards. And you might be right now in a wilderness of sin. Today is your day. Right where you are. I'm not going to ask you to come forward, raise your hand. Right where you are, you have a conversation with God. And turn your heart towards him. You turn your heart towards Jesus. You pray a prayer of connection with you and God. Go talk to the person who invited you today. And just have a conversation. I, I pray that I'm not quite sure what's going on, but I want to know more. Thank you, Lord.
David and Sandra, if you come up, if you need prayer for anything at all. We have uh, two people here who will be happy to pray with you and release the fullness of God for you. If you're struggling with anything, or you just want someone to agree with you in prayer, come on up. We're happy to pray with you. I'll just leave this altar open for a few more minutes, and then we'll uh, prepare to leave. So, Lord, we bless you and thank you. You're beautiful. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, God. Prayer partners available if you want to come for prayer. We're happy to pray with you. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We agree by faith. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. 